Correct. Great. So I'm going to call this uh, work council work session to order at two o'clock. And I can't say the date without saying something. This is the 23rd anniversary of the September 11 attacks. Uh, it's it's not something I'm going to speak to because it's uh, it's a far bigger thing than I really can speak to uh, the effect of it, what it meant potentially to everyone on this call and, and to this country. But I would just like to acknowledge it and say that we have not forgotten that. And to anyone here who experienced any direct personal uh, implications, I'd like to extend that uh, acknowledgement to you in particular. And um, yeah, just a reminder, and I think anniversary days are important to acknowledge. So thanks everyone. Uh, we are here to talk about water uh, in our ongoing series of talking about water. And one of the beautiful things I think that will come uh, from this additional conversation and then the conversations and coffee with counselors that was getting scheduled and um, will be available to everyone in the community. One, the, the biggest upside to all of this, I think, is the greater understanding we've been building and hope to continue to build amongst this, this, not just the citizens of Manzanita, the residents of Manzanita, but also the people who are not technically within the city limits who are served by this water system that we are the stewards of. So, uh, I'm looking forward to more of that today. I'm going to turn the running of the meeting over to Layla, who will be leading us through that. And then Layla, you can give us your own indication of how you want comments or questions to be handled. I would remind people, uh, I think everybody on here today is pretty used to this format, but just a reminder that council work sessions are not for public comment. This will be limited to, uh, at least in this work session, limited to comment amongst council with the people involved on staff, or in this case, a, a contractor that's been helping us. And the point of these sessions is to, to allow us to dive deeper into topic, much deeper than we could do with the time constraints that we have in our regular monthly council meeting. So take it away, Layla. Thanks, Mayor, um, and thanks everyone. So yeah, uh, talk about greater understanding. I feel like I have learned a lot over the last year and a half since we embarked upon this initial journey to um, update our water rates and then over the last couple of months. And before I start, I do want to take a moment to acknowledge the staff and the team here. Um, I'll be doing the presentation today, uh, but I do so with the coaching and guidance of both Tim Tice, so Tim, maybe you can wave your hand, with OAWU, who is uh, an expert in water rates, does them across the state of Oregon and has um, just been an invaluable resource to us and, you know, did this study um, and then taught me a lot about um, about how these things work. So thank you, Tim. And then, of course, Dan Weitzel, our public works director, water operations manager, and jack of all trades. Um, and so Dan has also been um, incredibly uh, helpful. Uh, we've spent hours and hours on the phone together and on Zoom calls uh, to get us to what I hope um, was both included in the packet, which is a pretty comprehensive wa quarterly water rate study update uh, to provide um, both this council and the members of the community with uh, what I hope was a easily understandable for a very complex um, issue uh, document. So my goal today here is to sort of walk us through that. Um, I have about 25 slides that really goes through the uh, study that's included in the packets on our city's uh, website today too. I would invite the council to kind of ask questions as we go along. I think it's important um, with the kind of technical information we'll be talking about that you know, my goal today is to really set a very solid foundation for all of you, in particular as the decision makers here, um, with an understanding of how water rates are created and what um, the options are before you once we get to the end. And so I'm going to take my time as I go through this. I'll probably pause uh, at the end of slides to allow for questions. Um, if you don't have any, that's fine. And they come up at the end, we can always address it there too. Um, both Tim and Dan are also here 
to address any questions that may come up that I may not have the answers for if you need um, additional uh, technical information. Um, these are the guys that I, I lean on for that. So that said, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Leila, can I ask a question real quick? You bet. Uh, was Tim the author of the 2023 study also? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Good question. And that's one of the things that I'll try to hit on here uh, early and often is that we, with the quarterly water rate study, endeavored to um, create an apples to apples comparison with the monthly water rate study that we completed and was adopted by the city council in July of 25 so that there's consistency um, there. Okay. And can you see my screen? Mm -hmm. See water rate study. Okay, just bear with me as usual. So I get my screens oriented, like I'm on a Star Trek Enterprise sometimes here. Okay, all right. So let us begin. Um, so just a quick overview for folks. I'm going to go through some background information again. I'm trying to level set everyone. Um, on this council, there were several of you that were not on the city council when the water rates were adopted back in July. So I always think it's important to provide kind of some background as to why we're here today, what we've done. Um, so I'm going to go through that and, um, and kind of why we're even doing a quarterly rate study. I think it's important for you and for the members of the community to understand why we're doing this at all. And I'm going to go through what I'm calling kind of guiding principles. So the rates that were set back in July of 23, there were sort of some foundational principles that were embedded in that, um, the adoption of those rates. And so I'm going to go over those because I think that does provide a good sense of why we're, why the rates were adopted and for what reasons. And I'm going to provide a little history and background of water rate changes over time. Um, those, I think, again, having a historical context is really important as we make decisions today to understand where we came from and why we're here today. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the methodology and the approach to the calculation of rates so that you have a really solid understanding of how we get to the options at the end of this presentation. Uh, a little bit about user characteristics as well, because that feeds into um, the methodology and sort of the structure, the criteria that we look at. So what are kind of some of the foundational principles of setting water rates? And then we'll get to the comparable options for quarterly billing. Um, this is recommendations, but we have two options for you to consider and to, to discuss. Um, I'm not sure that we'll get fully through a discussion or a decision today. Obviously, this is a work session. You can't make a decision, but I did intend that we would spend um, probably the bulk of today really kind of getting our feet grounded in um, the how, the what, why, and, and how. So to start with, um, back in 2008, our rates were $34.50. That was the base rate allowance for single family residential. Um, and there was an allowance of six units. And you'll notice throughout the presentation, I, I will refer often to single family residential because that constitutes the majority of our users and really sets the founding sort of baseline for us as we consider sort of a fair and equitable uh, base rate for users of the system. The city did a rate study in 2015. Um, they raised the rate $5. Uh, that was not what was recommended by OAWU, um, but they did also at that time decrease the allowance um, to four units from six. And they adopted what we call a meter multiplier for larger connections. And so that's part of the methodology we use now, which means the larger the meter, uh, the greater the fee that you pay. And if you look at our rate sheet, um, that's indicated there. But we did not adjust rates um, for inflation, really since 2008, there was no adjustment between 2008 and 2015 other than this $5 increase. Uh, so I think that's an important thing to note. 
And then the city updated its water master plan in 2021. And that's really important because the water master plan sets forth the capital improvements that are necessary for us to maintain our water system. And maintenance of the water system isn't just like keeping it clean, right? It's ensuring the longevity of the system and Deferred maintenance actually does have pretty big impacts on our ability to provide water service and can impact cost. And so the water master plan was a really critical step um, for the city forward in terms of providing kind of a safe, uh, resilient water system. And you'll hear me refer to that throughout the presentation today. The city initiated a water rate study in 2022. Um, that was, uh, I was here at that time. Dan and I worked together on this with Tim, and that's what ultimately led to the updated water rates uh, that were adopted in July of 26. And I'll go through that. Sorry, July of 23. <laughs> so, I went over this when we talked about water usage a couple months ago, but again, I think it's helpful to give context. We had multiple work sessions with the city council at that time, uh, talking through the water rate study, talking through many of the things that we'll talk through today. So there was a lot of thought and effort that went into educating the council and the community about why we needed to do this, how we did this, and we ultimately, uh, the city council on July 5th, 2023, unanimously adopted um, new water rates, which included the reduction of the water allowance to 2,000 gallons. And we also moved to a water, uh, a monthly reading and billing with that new rate and tier structure. And I'll talk a little bit more about that piece in a moment. Those rates were not implemented until 2023. Took staff some time to switch over that um, because we bill in quarters. Um, we needed to make sure that we were able to kind of kickstart that at a time that made sense with our quarterly billing. And so we do quarters. The last quarter of the, of the year starts in October. So we began that work in October of 2023. And then in June of 2024, the city council voted to not adjust the water rates for inflation. Um, folks wanted to have at least a year of data to understand um, to understand that, to understand what. And so we're in the middle of that that year right now. Leila? Uh, yes. Two quick questions. Uh, first, uh, you mentioned that when the council raised the rates after the 2015 study that they didn't uh, accept the recommendation fully at least, uh, of that study do you do you know what the recommended rate increase in 15 would have been i think tim can probably he's looking right now so okay uh the other point i just want to be clear on is so we had a base allowance of six units in 08 four units in 15 and two units in 23 and I think that um, that illustrates the fact that the number of units in the base rate is not calculated in order to provide a particular level of usage for a typical household, but it's calculated for other purposes, other reasons. But I, I, I think there's some confusion in the community. I think there's a, a sense that the base rate is designed specifically to provide um, an amount of water that a typical family would use. Um, that's That actually turns out to be statistically pretty accurate in Manzanita at two units, but it's not... Um, that's not the design. That's not the methodology. Is that correct? That is correct. And I I will hit on that a little bit more in a later slide. Um, but we we do use averages. And so the averages I'll be referring to today refer to an average of three years of usage data. So so let me circle back to that. But I think okay. that's 
salient and important point that you've made. Um, and then I see Tim has probably found the answer to your first question. Recommendation for the single family residential was $44 and 55 cents. So I just wanted to break in for a second also, um, because your uh, presentation at uh, your most recent presentation at the council meeting showed uh, the average single family residence to be at 1.6 plus units per month. But when I went back to look at the uh, 2023 study, the 2023 study seems to suggest that average usage amongst single family residences generally is 3.32. Um, so, um, I think that the, not having been there, I need to learn, but it seems that the ultimate goal was to charge a consumption rate for the additional amount, uh, in the effort to, uh, uh, uh encourage, uh, conservation. Am I wrong on that? Tim, can you speak to the 3.2? Because that, that doesn't track with, with me. I'm, I'm looking for that right now. As, as you're bringing it up, I'm looking across all my files to see. Yeah, I, I can find that. Point, it to, point you to it. It's, um, um, if you look at uh, the executive summary, page eight, um, in the second paragraph, it, the second sentence starts, once again, looking into average usage of 3.32 units of water for an SFR, an average water bill per month would be $60 in uh, $60 a dime. I do see that. And I think the only assumption I can make was that was the data that we were using at that particular time. And this new data that we brought in uh, corrected that. Okay. The uh, complaint that I'm hearing from residents is, is that um, the overall average that we're using right now um, isn't reflective of the fact that many, many of the houses are uh, not occupied full time. And so they're, they're vacation houses that uh, wouldn't be expected to use a normally normal month's consumption rate. Can I ask a question and maybe make a point of uh, how to proceed here? I'm wondering, with that kind of a question, which brings up a number of things about how the numbers are got at, the how what we consider a household, how we do not differentiate among households, would it make sense to hold that question, Layla, until you get us a little further through the assumptions that went into the, the water study and break that down. Then we can come back to Tom's point and the point that he's raising um, and with a little better shared information across the team here this morning. Would yes. that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, are you okay great. with that? Yeah. Is that cool, Tom? And then maybe Tim can dig into that 3.2 because we are really, we are using the same information that we use for the monthly rate study um, it was kind of confirmed with the current data we have from once we started with monthly rates that I presented a couple of months ago. I know from working with Tim on this, there's a lot of, a lot of numbers, a lot of data that gets thrown out here. And so I've done my best to really distill this down, um, into kind of what we're going over today, but we'll, we'll cover that piece of it in just a moment. Can I just ask one detailed question, uh, follow up on Jerry's? When we rate, when the recommendation was to raise the rate to 4450 in 2015, was that for 6,000 gallons or for the 4,000 gallons? Four. Because I think we lowered it from six to four, and I'm just yeah. not sure which, what was four. four. Okay. It was thanks. for four. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, so just a little bit more information on what a water utility is um, and how those are governed. So our water utility is governed by both the city charter and by city ordinance 90-8. 
it is an enterprise fund. And so that means, you know, not only do we keep the funds separate, but there's a specific definition of this in Oregon revised statutes or Oregon administrative rules, where an enterprise fund is really something that is financed and operated in a manner that is similar to a private business enterprise. So where the intent of the governing body is that the costs, the expenses, and including depreciation of the assets, of providing goods or services to the general, general public on a continuing basis is financed or recovered primarily through user charges. So that's why the user charges, it's so important that it aligns with what we budget for and all those costs that are associated with providing a system. The system should pay for itself. So again, new monthly rates were adopted by city council in July of 23 and were put into effect in October of 24. Uh, staff noticed a housekeeping amendment that needed to happen, which was a change of two words, uh, monthly, quarterly to monthly, and 90 days to 60 days. So we did not catch that when we adopted new rates. As soon as we did, we engaged city council, and then we brought forward a ordinance. And as we know, ordinances that don't have an emergency clause, which we didn't feel that we could justify an emergency clause for this type of housekeeping ordinance, take 90 days to implement. So city council adopted that ordinance on April 3rd. On April 8th, Randy Kugler submitted a prospective petition for referendum um, to uh, kick this decision to the voters as is um, any citizen in the city of Manzanita can do. Um, on an ordinance that was adopted. So as soon as that referendum was approved in May by the county clerk and assigned a number, we initiated the water rate study uh, in order to be prepared for the outcome of the vote in November. Layla, two points. You said the um housekeeping item for 2401 was to change the wording from quarterly to monthly from 90 days to 60 days. That was 90 days to 30 days. Thank correct? you. Yes. 90 yes. days to 30 days. Thank you. And one more question about uh, the Kugler referendum that's going to be in the ballot in November. The only thing impacted by this vote is a decision by the voters that we will be at a 90 day quarterly meter and billing reading or a 30 day monthly meter reading. That is the only decision that will be made on that ballot measure. Is that correct? That is exactly correct. And so okay. just so folks know, the ballot measure has been assigned a number. It's 29 179. This is the caption, the question, and the summary that will be on the ballot. And again, this is only to determine whether or not um, we maintain a monthly billing cycle or we revert back to quarterly. That's it. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. So I want to start a little bit with definitions. It's hard to get through something like this without using some jargon. And I apologize for that. We'll do our best to stay away from acronyms. But I do want to talk through, uh, you know, your basic vocabulary for this discussion today. And it's really important because these words have specific meanings. So when we talk about an allowance, we are specifically referring to the amount of water that a consumer receives as part of the base rate charge. Uh, so that's when we talk about the allowance of being, it was six units in 2008, the allowance turned four units in 2015, the allowance is now two units in 2023-24, uh, and that is what's within the base rate. When we talk about budget, we're talking about basically a single monetary line or in our case, it's a full budget for cost of personnel, the materials, the debt service, contingency, capital improvement projects in order for us to run and operate the water system. So that's what we're talking about when we say the budget. So like, what do we need every year in order to provide this service? 
When we talk about the base rate, that is the monthly charge to all consumers that help cover the costs associated with fixed expenses, which are reflected in the budget. When we talk about consumption, we're talking about how much water a user uses over a given period of time. But when we talk about the consumption rate, we're talking about the charge of water per unit of water used over the allowance included in the base rate. So you see why the <laughs> definitions matter right now. So, um, so that's again, a consumption rate is how much water per unit, the cost per unit over the allowance included in the base rate. And then the cost to deliver is how much it costs to, and that, I'm sorry, that should say to deliver a single unit, gallon or unit of water to the tab to the customer. So these are referred to a lot throughout the report, but I just think it's important for us to have a baseline understanding of the jargon, for lack of a better word, um, that we'll be using throughout today's presentation. So I want to start with kind of guiding principles. Um, when you do something like this, there, there's, there are reasons we make changes to things like this. And so there are a few things I just want to make sure that we cover so the folks understand kind of why we end up where we end up. So the budget is designed to cover the cost of production based on actual usage. So and that to support, again, the system operations, the maintenance of the system, and to provide an adequate reserve, for example. So, and I want to, I underlined that because it's production based on actual usage, which starting to get to the question that Councillor Spegman asked about why the base rate allowance is what it is. And I'll get there. But and when I talk about maintenance, I'm talking about things that we have to do to ensure that we have a reliable and a safe and resilient water system. Um, the picture that's on this slide is an actual picture that either I or Dan took um, when we noticed a catastrophic main failure on Dorcas, um, I think it was in early 2020, mid 2021. Uh, someone came over to City Hall, was banging on the door, was like, there's a water leak. And I went outside and this is what I saw. And that was spewing out at a, at a rate of eight to 12,000 gallons per minute. And why that occurred was because before we replaced Dorcas, which we just recently completed, this was an asbestos concrete main. And so when it breaks, it snaps and the water, it literally was just bubbling up until we were able to get staff out there within 10 minutes. If you do the math, it's about 100,000 gallons of water that was lost um, between the time that the main broke and this happened. So this is why maintenance is so critical. And one of the things that really changed between 2015 and 2023's water rate study is we are starting to now account for the projects that were identified in the um, water master plan, which had a focus on repairing asbestos mains that have the greatest likely for failure. And this kind of failure, it's terrifying to see in person. And, you know, we are responsible for ensuring that our system, again, is safe and resilient. Um, and we have a lot of projects to do to get there. Uh, another guiding principle that we really think about is ensuring that the single family residential customer who represents the largest proportion of customers pay the lowest rates possible. Now we talked about typical family. Uh, that's a, like, in many contexts, that can be a very loaded question. What is typical? right? In our town, we have a range of folks that own homes here, some that are here a couple of weeks a year, and some that live here full time. We have to account for everybody across the spectrum. And so that's why we look at the users as a whole, because we have to understand how all the single family customers we serve. And single family, again, that's also a loaded term. The industry's moving away from that. You'll probably hear that when we start doing the housing work is we'll be talking about single unit instead of single family because it connotes a certain type of construct. Um, but for now, that's the, that's the terminology that we use. 
Um, but these are households, basically, or, or homes, um, so non-commercial users. And so we're trying to get this to where they do pay the lowest rate possible. We also want to make sure there's an equitable uh, system in place for customers who use more water um, and that they pay for that usage, but we do it at the rate um, most reasonable rate possible to support the system. So for example, we know we have 260 short-term rentals, right? That use, likely use more water. And so we want to make sure that those households or those customers are categorized under this SFR category. And so we want to make sure that folks are paying for the usage um, that they use. And every family is different. So a four-person family differs from their neighbor in terms of water usage. I know that my dad, when I would take a shower, we had a household of five of us, um, would yell at me after five minutes of being in the shower, right? So each family has its own way of utilizing water. And so that's why we have to look at the system users and the customers as a whole to understand what production we need to plan for. And that's what we're trying to understand is how much water do we need to produce to charge a rate to get the revenue that we need in order to operate that system. So it's that's, that's kind of one of the key principles we have. And then that creates a much more equitable approach to how we um, apply our rates to these customers. We also want our rates to support water conservation. And so if we are seeing trends where folks are on average using less water, we don't want to allocate more water because then that disincentivizes people from using less water. And we are moving into an environment in which we now need to think the state is requiring us at a certain point, we'll get there to do a water conservation master plan and conservation is key. Um, and finally, we want the water utility to be self-sustaining. So that means it needs to pay for itself. And we also have adequate resources in order for us to be able to, again, maintain the system, avoid situations like this as to the greatest extent possible, which impact the system significantly. So I'll pause there for a minute and see if anyone has any comments or questions about uh, these guiding principles. Okay, time's up, moving on. So the quarterly rate study, this relies on the same methodology and the data that we used when we did the monthly rate study. And again, the guiding principles that I just kind of went through were the same kind of guiding principles that we used uh, to do the monthly rate study. And we also utilized the 2022-23 budget as the basis for this study as well, so that we were creating an apples to apples comparison. Um, this is particularly important because the city council did elect to not apply an inflation factor to the rate for the current year. So what we've come up with uh, for this study really does reflect an apples to apples comparison. And it's apple season, so it's a good metaphor. I do want to talk a little bit about kind of, you know, if only, and not to sort of shame ourselves for not having done this, but for folks to get some context to understand why it's super important for us to account for inflation as we provide a resource like this. Um, if we look at, on average, the inflation for water and sewer maintenance um, since 2008 has been on average 4.69%. If we applied that to the rate that we were charging back in 2008, the base rate for a single family inside the city limits would be $68.64 for four units of water. If we use the current monthly rates, $47.56, and then we add the two additional units of water to get us to that four, that gets us to $66.46. So they're pretty close, right? 
Um, and so this is why it's really important that we think about and we apply inflation. I think we know over the last several years, um, I recommended two COLA adjustments, one 6% one 7% consecutively. On average, inflation is about 3%. It's now below 3%, which is great. But these factors are really critical for us to keep pace with costs. And when we don't do that, we end up not in a great position. And so I just wanted to point that out as a way of just sort of indicating we're pretty much on target with where we should be. The other thing I think that's important to highlight here as well, and what I would be recommending so long as I'm here, is every four to five years, or if we do any kind of major capital improvements, that we conduct a rate study again. Sort of like what we do with staff, every four years we look at what um, folks are making, we do a class comparison study to ensure that we're offering competitive wages for retention and attracting the best folks to our team, right? In terms of maintaining a water system that has high capital costs, including costs related to staff, we also need to be looking at uh, our water rates and ensuring that we're just staying on target, that we're not charging too much and we're not charging too little. And so while these things kind of line up pretty well, I do think it's really important that we acknowledge and put into practice uh, something where we are looking at this, again, if we see a major capital improvement or if we take out debt or we do anything that affects our budget, we need to account for that by conducting another rate study to ensure that, again, our customers are getting um, the lowest rates possible based on the cost to the system. I, could I just make sure I've got something and clarify it? So to your example of the uh, what the inflation rate would have been from 2008 to now, you know, and how we basically are, are not too far off, um, that's really just holding steady. Yes. And that's holding steady from a time when we were not doing – and I can't go back mentally to the budget in 2008 to remember, but I'm thinking that probably did not involve a lot of capital work or maybe an occasional project like a Dorcas project. But I mean, that's basically just staying steady. It doesn't account for the additional needs that we might have over time as our system gets older and older and the equipment and it gets older and older, which is part of our responsibility to look at. And it also doesn't include or account for what it would take to do a large capital project, some of which are on the long range plan, but we haven't tackled yet. Is that right. the way to say it? Yeah, that's okay. right. Thank you. So I just, that was a really helpful measure for me. And again, I just think Studying these things, uh, giving us accurate data is really is really important. Okay, so the change in allowance. This is hot topic, um, and so I want to talk a little bit about that too. Again, rates ensure that the SFR customers, and I'm going to use that acronym. Is that cool, everyone? Okay, who represent the largest proportion of customers, ninety five percent of all users pay the lowest rates possible. So that was really our goal. And the allowance is the minimum amount of water based on our historical usage that enables us to establish a reasonable production estimate, which informs our budgeting. So again, back to Councillor Spegman's point, we are not trying to project what a family would use because again, that's a very loaded question. We don't, each family is different. Um, I know someone, for example, who has to do a lot of laundry for their business. And so they pay a lot more, but they live alone. Um, so, so the point here is that it's the amount of water based on our historical usage so that we can establish production estimate. And that estimate forms the foundation for our budget. It allows the utility, so that's us, to charge people for what they use and provides the lowest base rate possible. 
our previous budget really didn't account for the fact that we were providing four units of water for each single family rate payer. And using fact-based data from our own community makes it easier and it's more predictable for us to budget. And it's frankly just more fair to the customer. So we're looking at what does man's need to do? And we build and create a system that is specific to the unique conditions of Manzanita. And that's really critical because we are different than other communities. And so using our own data ensures fairness and equity to the customer. And it's fiscally responsible. And again, it's fair for the city to budget for what it expects customers to use Again, this is across the board on average, right? So not determining what specific family types use, but what our customers use on average using the data that we have. So it's a very data-driven, locally unique analysis that we do for our community. Oh, I didn't know it did that fancy across the board there. It's cool. All right. So I... I talked about this actually at a coffee with counselors and I got some good feedback from it. So thanks to those who, who gave me that feedback. So I thought I'd try to do it visually instead of gesticulating, which is what I usually do when I'm in person. So let's talk about how rates are calculated. Um, if we think of the budget as a, a big blue pie, <laughs> this is it, right? The budget that we were using again is from 2022, 23. So that's the budget, the pie is the budget. And that's $1.68 million. And that's what we're trying to set the rates to achieve. Best practice shows or sort of directs us to get 60 to 75% of the budget should be captured by the base rate. So again, that unit allowance, not base rate are tied here. So we want to set that base rate for both single family customers as well as non-single family customers, which are commercial users to achieve 60 to 75% of the total budget. The remaining budget should be captured by consumption, right? So that consumption rate that we talked about, what people use above and beyond the allowance included in the base rate. And we expect people to use water above and beyond what's allotted in the base rate, particularly in the summer months. And that's why we use an average because we account for that over the seasons to get us to 95%. So we're trying to achieve 95% of our projected budget with the base rate and the consumption rates. Again, how do we determine the allowance? So we use historic data to see patterns with our own unique community and we design a rate that provides the lowest possible cost for the majority of users, which are single family residential users. The average usage is 1,600 gallons per month for SFR. The average for all users, so that additional 5% you added in is 5,700, which is a huge jump, but they use a lot more water. And so I'll get to that in a minute, why that number matters. But that's where the two unit number comes from, is that on average, people are using less than 2,000 gallons per month. And the recent data that I'll get to the next slide that we pulled for October to July 2024 supports these findings. So it's consistent with the data that we use to establish the rate study initially. And then again, this information and the allowance allows us to best estimate production costs with, associated with operating our system. Layla, can you go back one second? Sure. So, um, the difference between 1600 and 5700. Um, can you explain how that occurs? Yeah, so that includes all the customers that are the 5% of customers that are commercial users. So that includes hotels, it includes restaurants, which are high water users, right? Even some grocery stores with their own butcher, um, things like that. So that drives up the overall average for all users. Great question, thanks. Okay, so again, just kind of remind folks, 
75%. So this is our most recent data between October and July of 2023, four, uh, use two units or less. Now we see that obviously goes down in July. My guess is August would look similar to July. September would look more similar to June. And then we're back in October. And this is very important because we're again, looking at all users within the system, not trying to subdivide by different family types, but all users in the system. So three quarters of the users, their single family are using two units or less. So again, if we go back to our guiding principles, trying to provide the lowest base rate possible to the single family user, this is why the allowance is set at two units. And it's based on the cost of production plus a little more to get us to that kind of ideal point. And for us, it's 70% of budget. So how are tiers determined? So back to this 5,700 or 5.7 units, this includes the commercial users. So that's why with the monthly rates, we started tier one at 5.1 because that accounts for the average and it again ensures the lowest possible cost to all users because we moved from what we call a uniform rate, which was it was one rate for any amount of water above the base rate allowance to a tiered rate. So the more water you use, the more money you pay. And so what we wanted to do was ensure that the folks that do use, and we expect folks to use, um, some folks, not all, but to use more than two units. And so we wanted to be able to set the rate for tier one as low as possible. And so that's why tier one is set at five because the average of all users was 5,700. And so that includes high water users in the SFR category, as well as commercial users. Again, to provide the lowest possible cost to all users. And the tiers are structured so that the less water you use, the less you pay. And obviously concurrent, uh, converse to that is that the more you use, the more you pay. So, you know, this came up in one of our meetings. You know, what happens if we just double the allowance? Why can't we just double the allowance? We would also need to budget for that, right? And so that means the base rate would double, but it would likely overcharge 75% of users who use two units or less per month. So to be fiscally responsible, if we are allowing four units of water, we need to charge for four units of water because we would estimate because we would need to plan for that production. It costs money to produce that water. And so what we have done is we have created a budget which is reasonable and based on data and based on our specific community that allows us to establish a reasonable, fiscally responsible budget that reflects actual usage. So Layla, a question for me is if we went down the road of thinking we would increase the current allowance in place of 2000 to 4000, which is what 75% of the FSR, SFR users consume, the base rate for 75% of the people would no longer be 47.56 it would be the 80, I'm sorry, in the last slide, I don't remember the exact number, but the 8336. So basically, you would have 75% of the people that are not using more than two units paying for four units to cover what we need to budget for the entire water system. Yeah, on average, right? Because in the summer months, they would likely be using that full allowance in other months they would not. So that's correct. And if you recall from the previous slide, if they just paid the tier one rates, it would be around $68 for four units of water. So just kind of getting back to our original budget. So the base rates set our current monthly rate now is set so that it covers approximately 70% of the budget. 
And then the consumption rate accounts for approximately 25% of our budget using the new tier structure that's currently in place. And that gets us to 96% of our $1.63 million budget, which is right on target to where we would need to be. Um, so that's, that's where we are today. And I just think it's really important we understand kind of where we are today, because now we're going to start talking about what it means if we moved quarterly. So then what is the 4% that's missing? Tim, do you want to chime in on that? So we budget to 96%. So we're hopeful that that, and again, budgeting is estimating, right? So we're estimating based on this cost that that's, that will cover the majority of our budget. And Tim, I don't know if you have any words of wisdom from your experience to add to this, but. Well, when we design the set of rates, that first tier gets us to 96%. The additional cost or charge for the higher tiers will carry you up over the 100%. That's our goal. Thanks. Okay. And again, we're basing it on reality, right? Like we're using existing usage, we're using um, our own data to set a reasonable budget. And since we know people don't use all of the single family residential, 75% on average, use two units or less, to have a higher allotment and to budget for that would be in excess or would encourage people to use more water. Okay. So all that said, just to set us up for our quarterly rate. So the base rate assumes on a quarterly basis, two units per month for a total of six per quarter. We developed a couple of options. And the first was simply triple the base rate and use existing consumption rates for the tiers. So someone recently asked a council meeting, it was a great question, like why are we even doing this study? And we wanted to make sure that council had defensible, factual information to make a decision um, should the voters determine we go back to quarterly billing to implement a rate structure that makes sense. And so we wanted to analyze what that actually meant to triple it because the math changes. And we also looked at a second option, which actually results in an adjustment to the base rate and new consumption rates to get us to budget. So now we kind of have that foundation. I'm going to jump into what those quarterly rate uh, options are. So if we just stick with what we have, we triple that base rate that's existing for monthly, and we maintain the same tier structure. Now the tier numbers change, right? We went from 5.1 to 10 to 6.1 to 15. So we tried to just make everything consistent. But we lose tier one from the monthly rate. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But we maintain $9.50 for tier one, $11 for tier two, and $12.25 per unit for tier three. And that gets us to 91% of budget. And why, you might ask. So simply tripling it doesn't get us to our target, which is 95%. And that's because if the tier structure is changed quarterly, it eliminates the revenues generated from tier one. So in a tier one monthly rate structure, that 2.1 to five units matters. When we capture that, that makes a difference in our ability to hit budget. If we don't capture that, that potential lost revenue um, that would have been generated if we were able to capture consumption on a monthly basis. So that affects our ability to achieve our budget. Leila, um, can you just, if it's possible, can you sort of uh, drill down on who actually would be benefiting from that loss of tier one? Um, Essentially, we're losing revenue if we lose tier one. Who are we losing it to? What can, what set of consumers would we be losing it to? Well, I'm a little uncomfortable to answer that question because it's conjecture on my part, right? So my 
What I would say is that someone that isn't using water on a regular basis, right, who is using water regularly would likely benefit. So if they're here more for a certain period of time and they use more water in one month and then they're not here a certain amount of time, it's possible that those folks would benefit. But it's, it's, it's a difficult question to answer. Um, and so I, I, I don't want to really go beyond that. So in order to adjust this, to get us back up to where we would want to be at 95% of budget, which is what, what we would recommend, is that we would need to do a modest increase to the base rate to get us again to that kind of 70% cost budget. And then we would want to modify tier one slightly to account for that lost revenue that we would get at a lower cost on a monthly basis. And so with this tier structure, we leave tier two and three alone, they stay the same, but we're able to kind of recapture that lost monthly usage on a quarterly basis by increasing the tier one rate to 1075 from 950. And that gets us to 95% of budget. So, and sorry, it's a little blurry, um, but this kind of compares across the board, the maximum someone would pay within each tier with the exception of tier three that can go up much higher, but for illustrative purposes, looking at the monthly rate, we estimated 20 units and for the quarterly 60, but it just gives you a sense of kind of what the maximum would be within each tier. Um, and so it's a modest adjustment to the base rate uh, the quarterly base rate option. It's a modest adjustment, but it gets us to 95% of budget. So this is my last slide and I can turn it, leave it up or I can take down my slides and we can have a con you can have a conversation about this, but this just sort of compares what the two options are that uh, OEWU came up with based on our data. So option one, just simply triple the base rate and take 91% of budget. Uh, or option two, we slightly increase the base rate and slightly increase the tier one rate to get us to 95%. I'm going to stop sharing unless anybody objects. And this is in your reports too. So if you have those handy and I can go back to this at any time. Okay. You're just bored to death. I've worked really hard on learning this. So well, I, I do want to make one point. I don't think you need to talk about it right now unless you you choose to, it, it's a little out of the flow of the focus on the rates themselves. But one of the great uh, pieces of information in the report was the uh, note about how water loss uh, has significantly gone down in recent years. Yeah. Uh, I do want uh, I do want to hear a little bit more about how that happened, what that means for the future. And in general, I understand that our rate of uh, water loss is, is pretty, uh, pretty good. Um, so those, I think are important points. I don't know whether it makes sense to talk about that now. It's not particularly germane. I don't think to the, uh, the rate study, uh, the rate analysis, I should say, but it's good news. And so it's good to hear good news. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'll actually ask Dan or Tim to kind of chime in on this, but it, it is actually relevant because water loss is an important factor for us, right? So the less water we lose, the lot, I mean, we still have to produce that water when we're losing it, right? So, so that is an important factor. Um, so um, why don't I give it to either Dan or Tim to talk about some of the improvements we've made, but even still, I think we saw a loss of 8 million gallons um, 
But still, that's less than 10% of what we produce, and we produce less now. So, Dan, maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the things that the city has done, um, and maybe, if it's appropriate, what benefits we might see from improvements to our water system through our maintenance projects that we have budgeted for within this rate study and within the current budget. Sure. So that's actually two pieces. It's not so much to as, as water loss is also water accountability. So when you look at things like water meters, we, you know, we've been upgrading our water meters and now what we see is like meters that are stuck. So they see a constant reading of zero. Well, we're able to look at the history and see, well, some of those are, should be reading uh, water usage. So we were able to go out and we've been correcting quite a few of those and finding them as we go as we go through the system. The other part of it is actually leaks, um, homeowner leaks that, that are account, accounted for, um, leaks in the water system that now we can see our usage for what we produce versus what we sell. And then that helps us to go out and look for areas that might be troubled areas where leakage and stuff happens. Um, the other thing that we've done over the last several years is we make sure we keep a good eye on our our hyd fire hydrants, essentially. For contractors, we provide metering for, which we charge for, water for, for bulk use. Um, so those are a couple of things that help. And the projects in the future are especially important because, as Layla showed, one of the projects or one of the things that happened here lately was we lost that line on Dorcas. Well, the projects listed that kind of put that cost on on the the budget is the replacement of a bunch of asbestos concrete lines. And so that's essentially been one of our target things that we want to do is eliminate the asbestos concrete. So leaks, you know, we've been working on, uh, water accountability we've been working on, and maintenance we're working on. But it all takes, of course, the funding, which we're talking about now. So... So that's why that number is really improved, Jerry, is because we get the data, we're tracking down where that where it's happening. Tim, you want to add anything to it? Uh, the only thing I can add to it in a simplistic form is $20.84 for a thousand gallons to be delivered to the tap comes out to about two cents a gallon. It's a little bit, it's in line with the rest of the state as far as delivery to the tap cost what we call delivery to the tap. And the less units you can, or the more units you can account for going to a tap and measure and track, um, obviously the more money you're gonna save. Uh, a 9% loss is, you're in the top four or 5% in the state. It's, it's remarkable, but you now have had the ability to be able to track this water. And it's all about tracking the water because your water permits are gonna be absolutely directly uh, impacted by how well you manage the water. And you guys are doing an awesome job in that in that regard. So Dan, what allows us to do that? What is why are we able to do to be able to to calculate and understand the exact amount of water that we lose? Uh, water metering. That's is it one just of water meter, there's no special so one of some of the other small things we do is like say a fire department comes over and drills in in our area they account for essentially a rough account calculation of what they use um but once again it's all about water metering and so in the last couple of years you guys you know instructed public works to move along in the meter systems well one of the biggest things is we took out meters that were put in in the 70s and now the meters we have out there are from roughly the 2000 and those are starting to swap out old meters over time they do lose accuracy and like i said we've been tracking that so we are really finding out you know where water has been going so are uh, is there and i know we've talked about this but as part of the cost of the water system are we uh upgrading those old meters and replacing them with new and talk a little bit about kind of time frame what that entails and the benefit of doing that so right now we're, we've been averaging trying to replace about 100 of the older meters a year typically water systems want to replace 
out um, your water meter every 15 years. So that's why we're we're shooting forward right now, just getting 100 of them. And that's in the operations and maintenance side of the budget. Right. Um, the new ones that we place in are digital. So in the future, uh, we can read down to lower numbers. Um, they also give us a lot more information uh, that we're shooting for in the future to be able to pass back o- over to the homeowner even. That includes automatic leak detection. When a meter discovers a leak, it sends a message to us and says, hey, come look at me. Something's not right. So that's a big part of the, of like I said, of, of our system is just as far as accountability is that water metering side of it. So how, and, how, how many more I'm, I'm thinking about? We have, we have about, about um, I want to say roughly about 800 meters left to be able to change out. So we figure it's going to be, I'm kind of figuring six years because once you get down to the, you know, Hey, we only have a couple hundred left instead of doing a hundred, you just finish your system out. And yeah, the the reason I'm, I, I think that's important, not only for uh, your ability to read, but it also allows the customer to Mm -hmm. see, I think four digits in their, in their bill. So instead of just looking at per thousand, they're looking at down to four digits so they really have a good sense of how much water they're consuming yeah the new ones are much much more accurate so we actually can read and see with us uh, on those new ones when we switch the whole system over we can see down to a tenth of a gallon okay so i'm just kind of putting a marker down i'd like to see that number increase if we could do that and so i'm gonna i will be lobbying for that Layla, in our, in our next budget, because I just think that's that's uh, given what we're going through right now, given the interest in water, which I think actually is a real benefit. I think this is as long as I've been on the council, we've never had this kind of detailed discussion about what we use, why why we're using it, what what's what it costs to do maintenance. Uh, we're really now talking about the realistic operation of our water system. And we are also talking about uh, how we calculate it and manage it and what the true cost is. I remember very clearly back to the 2015 uh, time frame when, as opposed to doing what we're doing today, which is really analyzing it, looking at the detail, being very um, uh confident about how we're doing this. I mean, uh, Tim's help and the kind of work we've done, we're really doing a good job. In 2015, we put our finger up in the air and kind of said, what do you think the customers would like to pay? And let's not ask them to pay too much. And what that does is just push that cost forward. So we're paying for that today because we didn't make those decisions in 2015. So uh, I, you know, as as tough as this is, um, and at, at, with the kind of work that Layla and Tim have done, um, there's a lot more accuracy around the numbers. We're making decisions based on facts as, a, as opposed to based on whims or feelings. And I think, it's, it's a little painful right now, but it will make a huge difference as we move forward. Um, and it is just, I mean, it just makes so much sense. I just, um, I just wanted to say that because I'm probably the only one that's been, it's kind of the old woman on the council. And I do remember those discussions and uh, I am much more confident in what we're doing today than what we did in 2015. And I really congratulate Layla for making sure we did, we are looking at it accurately. Um, we're, we're talking about facts. We're not talking about feelings right now. And I think that's important. Well, in that spirit, so when the, the council in 2015 was presented with a study that uh, would have raised the base rate by $10 and five cents. And basically you said, that doesn't feel right. We'll yeah, I, and I, I, right. I remember those discussions. I mean, right, right, right. It, no, wasn't no, based on, it wasn't based on fact. It was based on we just, you know, we don't we just don't want to push it out too much. We don't okay. we don't want to hurt. Our 
That's and that, and you were paying for it now. In the spirit of correcting that uh, approach, I guess I uh, don't see, um, personally, I don't see much of a, a decision to be made here between the two options. One option backslides uh, by 4%, uh, actually 5%. Uh, the other option is pretty close to the 96 that we had uh, in place. Um, and I don't know if I'm oversimplifying it. If I am, I, you know, someone should push back on me, but uh, it just seems like it was hard enough to uh, do the hard work of three work sessions and a council meeting and a expensive uh, study and an unanimous vote of a council to finally get us up to uh, where we needed to be. And it just doesn't make sense to backslide at this point uh, to me. Now, uh, I understand that we're not making a decision today and that we may not have to make a decision, but I I, I do think that uh, unless I can hear other argument to the contrary, I, I just feel like we should hold the line here and and not start backing off the, the, the difficult decision that the prior council made in uh, 2023. Yeah, so we're not looking to um, vote or even really get to consensus on that. I think the, uh, I think the, Tom, are you raising your hand or just turning your screen back on? I just turned my screen back okay. on, but I have my place in line also. Okay. I, um, I think that... <laughs> The, the timing of this is in, is interesting as we knew it would be because of the the um, the referendum coming up in the spring and then the time we needed to get the analysis done. But I'm glad that we are, and this is by design too. I'm glad that we are at the point where we've got at least some ballpark um, figures that can be shared with the community about this because I think I still think and and we're going to do our best to communicate. We have been and and we will keep that commitment. I still think there is this a feeling somehow or a belief that somehow rates are going to come down for individuals as a result of the cadence of the billing. And that's just, it's frankly, it's just not the case. And, but it's still out there. And I want to, we're just going to do our best to make sure that we do everything we can in the way of outreach, just to say, you know, look, it's what we started with. This is a, the choice on this um, ballot will be to stay with the monthly cadence or which is a yes vote or vote no because you want to go back to quarterly. And I just would like to make really sure that before we get to people getting their ballots, that every single person voting understands that that's not a rate. Uh, it's not a rate decision that they're making. And in fact, you know, my I like the um, the circle chart that Layla had. My my way of talking about it, and you can't see it online, but my way of talking about it was, this is the budget, and this is what we need to. Here, can you see that? How's it? This is the yeah. budget. It's <laughs> <better. laughs> and it's not. Yeah, and I'm I'm trying to be humorous, but it's not a humorous thing. I mean, we count on that water system, every single one of us, so much that we don't even think about it usually until something happens, and. Our, all of our jobs is to make sure that that doesn't happen, that it stays safe and reliable. So we've got this much, this much in the way of resources that are necessary to run that system. And there's no, there's not really any Peter versus Paul like shifting of who pays the the, the people using the excuse me, people using the water are going to pay for the water. It's going to look different. We're incentivizing. Um, we're incentivizing conservation, which is part of just what is going on in the state for all all resource use, electricity, water, natural gas. I mean, everybody's, we're all in that boat together. So I just, my hope would be um, for people who are watching today and or who read the report and or who will come to the, the counselor sessions that we're going to have, that we just continue to help um, understand and explain why this is the way it is. And we're not, we cannot go back to, well, I suppose a council could go back, but it would be incredible. We're not going back. <laughs> well, I don't want to do that. Um, but we, we've got to go forward with this, and that's the only responsible action that we can um, take. So, Brad. Uh, 
few comments, uh, some questions. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It clarified to me, which I've heard some feedback from the community and seeing things, um, trying to compare what's been done in this study to other national averages and other cities. So I think that was an important point to say this study was based on facts and the environment and how this city uses water is why we can't compare to other areas or national averages. One question, uh, you mentioned that the recommendation was to review or do another study approximately every four years. Do you, and this may be a Tim question, um, feel like with the projects such as middle housing, putting in some substantial development, mm. uh, that that is covered in the current study and looking at inflation? is going to keep us solid with those developments or is it potential we may want to look depending on how many units are added and how quickly development happens that we do this sooner than four years that's a good question i think um so a couple of answers to that i think we need to look at the pace of development because that will increase water usage obviously and so we would be tracking that. Development is usually pretty incremental. Even if we zone for it, it usually takes many years for that to change. Um, but we will want to be attentive to it. Uh, I think the adjustments for inflation will allow us to keep pace with our current costs. That's why I suggested something in the area of like about four years, unless there is a major change. So we add 500 housing units over four years, we should look at that. We should, and we will know, we will know because we will be selling more water. So we will be getting more funding, you know, but we would want to kind of reevaluate where we are with that. The other thing I'll note is that with system development charges, and that's something Dan and I are talking about updating too for water, those should cover the cost of the expansion of the system. The reason why the maintenance number is included in the operations budget is because it can't be paid for out of system development charges. And so that's why the consumer helps support the maintenance of the system through paying for the water utility through their base rate and their consumption rate. That's all built into that. So that's a great point. We would pay attention to it, but we would ideally be getting more revenue. We would just have to, I think it would be wise we saw a huge jump in um, housing units that we would want to kind of just refresh the study to kind of understand where we are. I think that's just a good practice generally for, for anything that is sort of driven by population, right? Is just understanding kind of what the impacts are in the system and then how do we reconcile that to make sure that we're budgeting correctly, we have enough resources to do that, and so on. So, but I do think it's important to point out that distinction with respect to system development charges versus um, the cost for maintenance, which is not something that we can pay for out of um, out of the water maintenance fund. And, and for those of you who've been here a minute, uh, Linda, you'll know that, like, and Jerry, too, I think you'll know that it took us years to do Dorcas. That was one maintenance project, one. <laughs> and that took the full kit, like, that took the full kitty. And we had to, you know, we were able to use some SDCs because we expanded the system somewhat, but we had to draw from maintenance costs, too. And so it takes, this allows us to get these projects done a little quicker uh, as we're budgeting for them we can pool those resources and actually execute on those projects. And we just haven't been able to do that really to any great extent since the water master plan was done now three years ago. Um, and I'm a firm believer, you do a plan, you implement that plan. And so we need the funding to implement that plan. And that's what we have been budgeting for. And so in order to do that, we've got to pay for it. Clear. Yeah, here, here. Um, um, a couple of points not necessarily related to the study, but surrounding water that I've seen in various places and heard. Um, 
I did look on our website and saw that there is an area with very specific instructions about how to set up electronic billing. I know that's been discussed in the past. That does help alleviate some administrative costs if people are receiving bills electronically and paying them as such. I saw a couple comments that someone said, I'm not signing up for this because there is a surcharge or a cost to do it. I myself have signed up for automatic payment and electronic delivery of statements, and my bill amount is reflected exactly the same on my credit card statement. So I don't see any type of surcharge or or something appearing differently because I've chosen to pay electronically via credit card versus mailing a check. Can you verify that? Yeah, for sure. So the city of Manzanita does not charge a surcharge. So we do not on our end. We actually, we incur those costs and we um, pay for them. They're included in our budget. So any user... financial institution may do that. So the user's financial institution may possibly charge a fee to that person to pay. So I, my financial institution used to charge a fee if I did an electronic check to pay for something. So it's, it was my bank charging me, but the city of Manzanita does not charge the customer for that directly. Um, clear. Um, also saw um, some talk about people being charged surcharges and late fees because of the change to monthly billing. Have you seen that? Is that something that's happening often? Or could you just talk a little bit about the the impacts from a billing standpoint to those end users when we change the monthly billing? Sure. So I don't know what the surcharge is. Um, we don't and neither. It wasn't clear to me. We don't I, do any kind of surcharge. Answer. Can I just interject. I, I think surcharge is an effort to mischaracterize the consumption rate. Um, there mm-hmm. is talk about uh, the people exceeding the allotment right. and then being charged a surcharge. Oh. So, so that's that your pricing. That, is a, uh, yeah. that is a purposeful mischaracterization of what's going on. Yep. Thank you, Jerry. Yeah. Um, so in terms of late fees, we did not start doing late fees until January. So we went into effect. We gave people kind of a full quarter to get used to it. We charged late fees in January. We charged them in February. And then when we realized we needed to make this change to the ordinance, we stopped charging um, late fees so please pay your bills on time, but we are not currently charging late fees and we have not charged a late fee since the February billing cycle um, because, because this was um, as soon as we kind of knew we needed to make this housekeeping change that we felt that that was the most prudent approach was to just say, you know what, until this is cleared up, we will not be charging any late fees, but we still ask that people pay their bills on time. Yeah. And uh, one last point for now. Um, seen some discussion around visitors and people who don't live here full time should be making up the difference or somehow subsidizing uh, the income or budgets for waters. And there was some suggestions of using TLT revenue to subsidize the water system or the budget for water. Has that been considered at all or discussed during the study, or is that even possible? Um, So if I'm understanding, so using like general fund TLT or the revenue we generate from TLT as a source of revenue to subsidize the water fund, is that what you're asking? Correct. Um, No, we, we have absolutely not considered that. Um, as I mentioned, when I defined, you know, the state defines a water utility as being something that's primarily financed through user charges. Right. Um, that is certainly not some a practice that I am familiar with, nor would I, I recommend. Um, as we know, our general fund and the majority of city operations rely uh, greatly on the transient lodging tax. And 
that is a variable income source and subsidization of an enterprise fund that is actually designed to use user fees to make itself operate um, would be would certainly not be something that I would recommend as a um, responsible approach to managing the water uh, system. I think it would be, um, I think there's a number of, of, of issues that would raise red flags. Now, it's not uncommon for a general fund, for example, to perhaps lend the water fund resources to say, do a major project and then it gets reimbursed for that. But for ongoing operations, um, that is certainly not something that I would encourage nor recommend um, for, for our city. Um, it would also probably raise a red flag from an auditing standpoint as well, that if you're subsidizing an enterprise fund, th there's probably a certain threshold that we would hit that if we are subsidizing the water fund with funds that are targeted for the general fund, uh, that it would uh, potentially cease to be an enterprise fund, which creates other complications. So, um, so no, we, we, we didn't even consider that. Again, one of the guiding principles that I referred to earlier in the study um, is that, you know, I think the most fiscally responsible thing for us to do is to ensure that the water fund itself is a self-sustaining entity as it is designed to be. So if we were in a position that we needed to subsidize some enterprise fund, we've not done a good job at budgeting because that should not be required. Yes, I would agree with that statement. I did have one point, one more point. Could you briefly go over the timeline regarding when council would potentially need to make a decision on the quarterly billing, the two options as compared to um, the result of the referendum vote in November. Is this a decision we make before then, or do we wait until we see the results of the election to make that decision? The way that we, so the time it took to kind of get to where we are today has put us in this spot. I think um, my guess is you're going to need some time to digest this information. Um, I know you want to go out and talk to members of the community. So my expectation is we'll have one more work session on this, which would be in October. So the earliest I think council could make a decision would be in November, which happens to be the day after the election. So I think what my hope was and what this team, and I have to say Tim worked really hard to get us here, um, worked rapidly to get us here, is that you have the ability to make that decision if necessary in November. So we wanted you to be well positioned to do that. And so right now you're set up to do that. I will note that the way that the quarterly water billing works, that we would not be able to implement that until January of 2025, because that's when uh, we start January billing. And so got you. we have on our end, prepared in terms of giving you the information to make the decision about the rates and then staff has worked to ensure that we will have the time to then um, it's not just flipping a switch for us there it's there's quite a bit of um, work that needs to go into reversing that which we're prepared and capable of doing um, but we would hit that switch would occur january 1 and get us back onto a quarterly um, system if that's what the voters decide clear thank you if I might, I'd Sorry, like to, to talk a little bit about our communication strategy. Um, I think this has been an excellent presentation, Layla and Tim. Thank you so much for your technical guidance. I don't know where we would be without you, so thank you very much. Um, and I am delighted that we have as many people here as we do, but there are a lot of people in our community that we want to have uh, discussions with. We want people to understand we want to take the time to go through the data. Um, we want to have those communications. So the first opportunity to do that will be on Thursday the 19th with Coffee with the City. It's at Offshore Grill. And it they, we do provide coffee and goodies, uh, which inc hopefully encourages some people to come, which would be great. Uh, the next uh, series, are we're going to go again with conversations with counselors 
through the month of September. They will be on Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, the times will vary. We're asking you again to do an e bite and that should go up on the uh, website by Friday. Um, and just uh, the reason we use that is to make sure that we kind of manage the people that are there so that there we don't have 20 people at one and three people at another. So we try to, to make sure, and we don't have really large groups. We like to keep them to about 15 people in terms of perspective. In October, we will add Monday to that. So we will do Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday through the October 16th work session. And one of the one of the things we want to do in both the September and October uh, conversations is we want to gather frequently asked questions. Um, so we want to we want to make sure that that we've answered those frequently asked questions, and uh, we will hopefully be putting the answers to those. We'll deal with that on the sixteenth, and we'll hopefully be putting the answers to those frequently asked questions on the website and also in the water bill. So part of our due diligence during this process is just capturing the questions you have and making sure that they are available to people who don't have the opportunity to come to these sessions. Uh, so if you have any questions, uh, it's, it will be on the website on Friday. Um, please, we have a city council uh, email. That's a really good way to clarify any of these issues. And we encourage you to encourage other people to come. Um, it's This is very straightforward. There's logic and reason behind it. And this is our opportunity as city councilors to have direct conversations with our community and uh, understanding where uh, where people are. So I encourage you to come up to conversations with counselors or uh and or to the uh, coffee with the city uh, this Thursday. Just to follow up on that, um, as we get those questions during those uh, meetings and in the city council mailbox, I will make a commitment to make sure that our often asked questions on the website, which has been now uh, accessed by quite a few people, is really updated with that information so it's available. For, that's for great. Thank see. you. Yeah, that's a really, really easy way to access that information. So thank you. I see Tim has his hand up. Mayor, if you don't mind, let, I can address a couple things. Um, with this particular study, and I think the single question that's going to be driven home that that that, that you as a group will have to answer is, are my rates going up? Are my rates going down? And the question, the answer to those two questions is no. Uh, subjectively, we had to look at a good set of numbers, but objectively, we've been able to extract even better data this time around than the 22-23 study, okay? If we want to dig down deeper and get into a ever better details, I'd highly recommend reclassifying the short-term rentals away from the single-family residentials and so we can be able to track them as a separate group and then literally look at better defining how much water they use. When we talk about retired couples, full-size families, part-time users, vacancies, STRs, it really does muddy the waters as far as the data. But the data that we were able to extract from this quarterly review was much better than just a couple years ago. And that's just understanding the, the system softwares. Um, I'm probably, it's gonna sound like I'm gonna shoot myself in the foot, but one of the things that we try to, to do is have Layla and Dan understand not the OAWU approach, but just an approach to water rates where when they get it, they don't ever have to call us back again. You're going to function on your own. And I know that sounds odd, but but having said that, to do your annual adjustments based on the, the consumer price index that we've shared with you, you know, to look at your capital improvement planning every couple, three years, to look at seeing if you have a huge increase in, in units being built and that kind of stuff. Yeah, those are some nuances that kind of can change the configuration a little bit, but I'm extremely confident in whatever the vote cho chooses to stay either monthly or move to quarterly, 
the numbers we've provided you are going to meet your budget and not have any significant impact on the, what the people are going to pay. Um, it's been driven home, and we try to do take care of and try to think of those that don't use any water and absolutely assure by state rule that those who are using more water will understand that they're using more water, and they do that by paying for that water. So with that, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, I've still got Jasmine here, so if the <laughs> place for pandemonium, um, please bear with me. Um, thank so, Catherine, thank you for referring me to the 2023 League of Oregon Cities Water Rates Survey. Um, I thought it was an insightful document. Um, and uh, one of the things I learned by reading it is even though um, the water uh, districts and supply groups across the state, of them only 33% responded to the survey. Uh, of those that responded, there were absolutely zero that bill on a quarterly basis. Um, um, we didn't respond, so we weren't even considered on that, but um, um, it would make us an outlier if we went into a quarterly system. Um, the other thing that I saw was, was that Nehalem had the highest rate of increase, a 58% increase last year. Um, and I think we all know that Wheeler pays more than we generally do, even if you're in tier one. Um, so amongst our neighbors, Neal County is more expensive. Um, and so um, in any event, you're getting a bargain on, on water. Um, so, and then Tim, I just really want to thank you for giving us continuity in this study um, and being able to do that and make it so it's less expensive than going back and considering it all from square one. Um, and this may have not been an expense that we, well, we needed to make the expense and we needed to, to have the study done, but the fact that you were able to keep the expense of it down, uh, I think everybody on the council really appreciates. Um, so that having been said, um, and I agree, this is time to go forward, not to look backwards, but there were things, uh, that came up in previous sessions, um, where there was at least, um, one idea that was floated that the STRs should be charged at a commercial rate. Um, and I don't know that I, I didn't see that th we ever came or anybody ever came to what the real fiscal impact of that would be. But if we do have to go back and really tear this whole thing apart, um, I'd like to know the answer to that. Um, and, uh, and so I'm appreciative of your suggestion to start at least uh, getting better data on what the true usage is of the STRs. Um, and of course that means that we've got to go out and get data and do another analysis. And I'm curious to know at what expense. Um, and if we went through that, is that also an opportunity for us to be able to try to figure out uh, what full-time residents are paying as opposed to part-time residents? Because it's not been broken up. Uh before Tim, before Tim, that's not really a Tim question. I think it's a question for us. I, I think he's made a suggestion. I'm not sold on it. Um, the STRs are set up to be like everybody else, to be billed based on volume. And that's the whole heart of this study. So I'm not going to presume and council would need to make a decision um, in conjunction with Layla and staff, that that would be something we want to hang on. <laughs> that would be something that we would want want to entertain. Also, during those discussions, there was some, I mean there was some work done, and the decision was made not to treat them as a commercial entity. Wow. And there were reasons for that. Not all of us were here for those discussions. But if we're going to revisit that, we need to go back and get grounded in that, which we're not going to get done in this meeting. And I'm certain, I'm sure we're not going to talk about future contract costs with with Tim, although he might be able to pull one out for us real quick. So mm -hmm. I think that's that's food for thought. And there's reasons council did not take that path in the past. And rather than burning, rather than loading this meeting up with all the history we've had, I'd like to defer that maybe for some 
offline, not offline, but a conversation, um, Tom, maybe where you can spend some time with Layla on the history of that. And if we need to revisit it as council, we will. But I'm I'm not taking that as a given that we would do that. We have to have some discussion. And uh, while it's we still got technically a little time. I'm not sure we want to really go there and finish the work session with with another 20 minutes of discussion on that. If 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 you're okay with that, although I know I can see Tim wants to say something, so go right ahead. I I'm, I'm sorry, Mira. I yes, I need to clarify something. When I say extract the STRs from the short single family residential, I didn't mean to actually put them. You can put them in commercial. Yes, I'm ta- saying billing software wise. If you can put them with a different rate code, then we could then have that code separated from the single family rate users. I see. And I also am not sure we need to know that. I'm okay. I'm super careful on this. Nothing to do with you, Tim, and your suggestion, but no. I, I don't know. I don't know if that's what we want to do. And there's when you gather data and you classify things, it, mm-hmm. it, there are always more consequences than you might think. So I'd like to give our city manager a little time to chew that over and then we can come back to it. Fair enough. Oh, I'm absolutely. Happy. I just, okay. Yeah. 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 No, thank you for clarifying. Yeah. Catherine, I just want to say briefly though, that uh, in the conversations about this with the prior council, it was a, it was a well discussed topic and I think it was a close call to not, classify FTRs as commercial. The reason being that we thought the uh, consumption rates would take care of the the real issue is uh, high use by STRs. So uh, I do think that there might be some value in getting that data to verify whether or not, uh, in fact, the consumption rates address the real problem or the real issue. It's not a problem, but obviously if STRs use more than um, typical households uh, and the consumption rates collect that, uh, we're good to go. We just don't know as much as we perhaps could. Um, so I, I'm i with you. Let's not uh, make any assumptions, but if we can get some of that data uh, to inform us going forward, I think that's that's helpful. Okay, we're, we're bound to have some spirited discussion about that. That's good. That's good. Does anybody else before we do our thank yous at the end, does anybody else have anything for the good of the order? We go. Okay, thank you to everyone who showed up from the public. Thank you for everyone who will be looking at this in future. And uh, thank you very much to staff, to Layla and to Dan for the work that went into this and to Tim of OAWU. Uh, <laughs> we appreciate the help and um more to come, but we accomplished what we set out to do in the work session, and we've got a much better understanding of the impact of uh, quarterly and what we need to do in terms of billing. So I want to thank everybody for their time this afternoon. Until we meet again, the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>